Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and we are in for a treat today because I am speaking with this, a guest, and we're going to talk about channeling galactic art, among other things. We're going to find a lot of synergies, I believe, in this next hour. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest. She was born and raised in India. She left India in 1997 to come to the U.S., and she, was, she got her master's as a double E, electrical engineer. She's been in IT for over 16 years, which sounds familiar for those that listen to the podcast. And in IT, she thought she was set. That's the life she was living. And then life changes, as we all know. There's no accidents. And she found herself in a world where she was actually introduced to Paul Selig. So Paul Selig, uh, some of you guys know, um, I actually talk, spoke with him when he comes to Atlanta. He's a great channel. He does the I Am Word series. And our guest, she credits her spiritual awakening to the books written by Paul, which are words of wisdom. She has the, her, This book is called The Lion's Wisdom. And we're going to talk so much about it, I'm sure she's going to be a better explainer than I am in channeling galactic art. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Uma Shankari to the podcast. Welcome, Uma. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so happy to hear Paul. Uh, And I'm happy to know that you know Paul and the viewers know Paul because he is, uh, like you said, he's such a huge, huge uh, contribution to my life, his work. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. And Paul is great. And, you know, Paul's not for everyone because it's really interesting when you, in this world, when we have conversations of of music, what type of music you like? Oh, I like country. I like rock and roll. And some people are like, what kind of channels do you like? And Paul has that echo channel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but it I'm resonated. It. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But before we go into you meeting Paul, sounds like it was a total different person you were what was life like being raised in india okay so you know i it's because we are talking this is leading into the segue so i'm going to talk about imperfection today a lot okay because i think that's the topic that's coming up um you know the segue from paul is like he has that echo right that is so uncomfortable for a lot of people right so because our uh, conversation is going to be a lot about sound as well i'm going to um, there's something that's coming up that we're going to focus on that today. Okay, so basically, I grew up uh, in India, like you said. Um, but I, 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 you know, when I look back, um, I don't think it was as dramatic as I think my spiritual evolution has been. I think when you get a kick in the butt at the, the last stage where you're like, you can't sit anymore, that's where the Big Bang happens. Um, but I actually had my first spiritual awakening uh, when I was eight, uh, a second major one when I was 13. And um, uh, about 10, 15 years ago when, my, when I was talking to my mom, my mom said uh, I shared uh, a dream with her which came through that evening. Uh, I told her that I, uh, in my dream I saw my sister slip rogue, my younger sister, and in the, my mom thought, what? And then in the evening, exactly less than 12 hours later, my sister slip broke really badly. Um, <clears throat> so, and then uh, things get, kept a while when I, ha- I had a crisis in 2006, and then I was like, okay, I need to look at some things in my life. And I looked into it, and then um, in, uh, even, let me take a step uh, backward in 2005 I had a very significant experience and it was I was able to read people's relationships like that like I would know whether they'll make it or not like literally real-time information I got so two of my friends had gotten married that year different times both of them I got a message um, that you know they're going to be separating um, but that's not the interesting thing. What happened is uh, one of my really good friends, uh, I'm walking in Lincoln Park uh, in Chicago, beautiful uh, Sunday or Saturday afternoon in June. I hear a really long sentence that my friend is going to separate from his partner, 
and, uh, you know, he's going to be separating on such and such date, blah, blah, blah. And I was at that time very logical in everything I did. Being an engineer, having a computer background, um, you know, and working on all things logistics and logical, I just couldn't fathom what was just said. And I thought I was making up in my mind something about my friend's marriage. So for a second I sat on the park bench, processed it with my mind. I said, I'm a horrible person. How can I think like this for my friend? So anyway, lo and behold, (laughs) exactly on that date, my friend came to me and said, I am separating from my wife. And I was like, okay, this is, I never told him about this. Um, Same, uh, around the same time, one of my friends, other friends who was married, uh, I got I got a message saying, um, you know, in two weeks your friend will call you and she will separate. She'll tell you that she's separating from her husband. So anyway, at the end of the year, what I did is I said, you know what? I don't want this information. It's too much to bear. I don't know what to do with it. Take it away. Literally, just like that, it went away. And the next five to six years, I was in contemplation about what happened. I went back into my regular life. I was leading my regular life. This, this question just persisted in my brain. And in 2012, I used to go to a salon, and I got an email that, you know, uh, something about uh, energy healing. I kid you not. Something or someone was tugging me to go and do an energy healing session, just pulling me calling me, and I was like, you know what, I don't do these kind of things. That's focus, focus. Who does it, you know? And I'm thinking I put energy healing into psychics, you know, uh, in the 90s, you used to have television ads come in, you know, where psychics will talk about, like, oh, you have had a bad love life. I'll fix it for you. And for me, that was the, that was the image I had about what psychics are, what healers are, you know? So uh, basically, the tug gets so loud and so, like, you know, persistent, I said, you know what, I'm just going to go and check it out. Once I check it out, I will realize that this is not for me. It's the stupidest thing I've done in my life, and I can go on with my merry life. (laughs) Was I wrong? (laughs) What happened is I had all my chakras awakened and opened. Mm -hmm. I did a 10-part series of energy healing. Around February of 2013, I was sitting on my couch and I said, you know, I understand divine perspective much better than I ever did. So I want to learn about love. So when I said love, I wasn't talking about the romantic love. I'm, it, it was a vibrational ask. So I went to online into Amazon, <laughs> Paul Selig's second book, The love, Book of Love and Creation, shows up. And I was like, I wouldn't have read that book had I not done the energy healing. Because for me, everything is so logical. And Paul's book is channeled. Mm -hmm. And it's the second book in his series. And being the logical person that I am, I thought, you know what? Am I supposed to read this? I knew immediately that I had to read his book. I read the reviews, and I'm like, it was channeled. And I'm like, okay. I understood part of the energy healing. I understood what channeling meant. For the first time, I was open to it. So after I did my energy healing sessions, my chakras were so open, I started hearing really, like, very soon afterwards. And so I was like, I I saw the uh, Book of Love and Creation literally on Amazon, and I knew I had to read it. And I was like, okay, there's the first book. What do I do? I had a tug of war within myself. So literally, I was combing my hair. I asked a question. I went to the bathroom, and I said, why don't I ask? I asked, mm-hmm. and the message I got was, you asked for the second book, we recommend you read the second book. And that's how my journey started. And in mm-hmm. 2014, it was very clear for me I had to leave the corporate world because life had something for me. And in 2014, I quit a very high-paying job in management in J.P. Morgan. And I was so ha- like the day I was about to leave, I was in trepidation until the week of, you know, let me take a step back. For six months to a year, I knew I had to quit my job. But I couldn't really wrap my head around it because I'm the only person in the U.S. My entire family is in India. 
there's nobody to support me if I had to quit my job. So, but then the closer I got to the decision, I knew every sign was given to me. It was, I was ushered into it with such grace. To this day, I'm fascinated by it. So the day I came, the quit my job, the next morning when I woke up, I felt relief. My, the burden that I used to feel just literally washed away. And, you know, I've lived in Chicago for 22 years. For the first time, I, I was able to go out and have lunch in broad daylight and just <clears throat> enjoy the weather. So, yeah, that was the first thing. And then one thing led to another, and here I am talking to you. Oh, I love it. I, I love it would be great if we can see in real time where the dots connect, but whenever we always look back, that hindsight is twenty twenty, and you realize that's yeah. where, you're, where you are today. Yeah. It, my first question in 2005 when you are able to read people's relationships, uh, what's it like now in 2020? Do you turn that off because relationships are either going to get stronger or they're going, they're going in all tangents in 2020? Well, 2020 is more fascinating for me than ever. See, for me, still really, it's, for me, it's all encompassing now. The work I do <clears throat> is not just relationship or that, just this or just that, right? I think what happened was in 20, 2005, they were tapping on my shoulder and saying, you have this ability. I've been clairvoyant since I was eight. <clears throat> now they were giving me a new experience of clairaudience. Now, I didn't know I was clairvoyant because I was, you know, when you're growing up, you have certain abilities and nobody's there to support you because your parents don't know what that is. You know what I mean? For me, 20, 2005 was a clairaudient experience. So, you know, it took me up until 2012, 13 to realize that was a clairaudient experience because I was like, if I reflect back, I got a really long sentence. Nobody thinks in long sentences. We think in like chunks. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it was like, the first time I realized, oh, my God, it, the answer to my question was given. So today, you know, with my work, especially my artwork, it awakens all your chakras. It, it is about dealing with your life in totality, and that includes relationships of all sorts, which, which mark the basis of who we are on this planet. Let me ask you, when you moved here, and you started your, you know, your schooling to go to uh, your higher education, what have you. Uh, I just had a recent interview with a director of, of this new movie coming out uh, called The Real Exorcist and, out of Japan. And as we were speaking, he was talking about how uh, the spiritual community is continuing to grow there. And I was using the example of how opposites usually attract. And I was using the 1960s where... Here in the States, a lot of people moved to India and um, were going to the ashrams and all that. And it was this huge push, at least in the, in the U.S., to the, to the East. And when you were sharing your story, it's kind of like, like you're now tapping into that original foundation, but you didn't get it while you were in India, where to an outsider, it seems like it's more natural. You know, that's, that's a really good question, but, you know, a lot of people think India is very spiritual, uh, and it is true. But growing up, what others see as spiritual was normal for me. You know what I mean? It's just part mm-hmm. and parcel of my life. I'll give you an example. Like, I, in my family, you know, uh, agarbatis, incenses are a regular thing. You know, we don't do it just because you know, we're trying to create a space. It's just a natural part of the day, you know. But I will tell you, um, a huge realization has occurred to me that every part of the world is highly spiritual. Every grain of dirt, every grain of sand carries spirituality within it. When I look back from where I am right now, I, I'd be careful how I say this, <laughs> India is spiritual, but in a state of more ritualistic. You know what I mean? My family was very ritualistic. And, mm-hmm. and I think part of the thing is, I'll be honest with you, when I go to India, I don't feel as spiritual. 
Because if you think about it, you know, in all cultures, if we haven't taken spirituality and elevated the society, then we have failed miserably in spirituality. Mm-hmm. You know, India is an exotic location. And for me too, I love going to India. Okay? But for me, Egypt is an exotic location because I wasn't born there. For a lot of people, mm-hmm. India is an exotic location, but I'm going to reel it back to the U.S., okay? What I'm learning these days is the amount of spiritual structures that have been laid down by ancients in the U.S. is innumerable. And we're walking past it. We're walking through it. We're standing mm-hmm. on it, and we don't know it. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's not you know, India or here, I'll be honest with you, for me, I was born in India, but I don't call myself an Indian. I, was, mm. I live in America, but I don't call myself an American. I live on this planet, but I'm not a human. I am a galactic being. I, I am all encompassing. That's what brings me joy. Mm. I, I'm all about disabling borders. I'm all about erasing the division. Outwardly, I look Indian. My heart is in India because I grew up there. I have a lot of memories there, but my soul is expansive. Mm -hmm. You you made up a really good point about, and thanks for sharing that clarification, when you say that your galactic being is huge in that, the traditional sense of someone speaking of a galactic being or uh, otherworldly things or outside of themselves, whereas you have internalized it. How were you able to make that switch? Well, I'm going to jump from the lion's wisdom. We'll talk about the lion's wisdom later, but I have to switch to my galactic art. So in 2017, I attended one of Paul's workshops, okay? Mm-hmm. And I got up and I asked, hey, uh, what is my purpose and the guides that addressed all everybody in the room and they said you all want answers and they looked at me and they said you're in your way of your own purpose and I said you know what that makes sense I came home the next day I I haven't read the rest of Paul Selig's book I have only read four or five of his books because of my own channeling the third book there is a chapter called the wisdom to this day it is the favorite chapter in his entire series. And it talks about your own innate wisdom. So I I sat, meditated, I pulled up that chapter, and I aligned to my wisdom. And I said, I'm going to just jot down words. I meditated, and I said, I'm just going to jot down some words. Lo and behold, it was a four or five pages chapter. The next morning, I had my arms vibrating, I knew immediately that I had to write. So I finished 21 chapters in 21 days, and the book is called The Playground, which is not at released. So I kept writing. Every few months I would get, I would know that I had to write, and I would write. So like that, I, I started my sixth book last November because I was woken up one day and said, get ready to write. And I said, okay. I knew it was the next day I was supposed to write. When I looked back, it was 11-11, okay? Mm-hmm. And when I was writing, uh, you know, even though I've written six books, it's still sort of like because I'm a, I'm a clairaudient and a clairvoyant, most of my work comes from clairaudience. Mm-hmm. And the book, when I started the book, it is called Awakening the Buddha Consciousness, A Modern Day Guide to Achieving Nirvana. This is the name of the book. And I started typing at such a lightning speed. I couldn't believe it. And every single word that was coming through the book, I, I didn't know one word they were talking about. And I was like astounded. At the end of the chapter, they go, you're going to be downloading 11 codes. And they gave me each of the 11 codes. And I was, I was petrified. So why was I petrified? See, writing, I was getting used to. Now they're telling me they're going to be downloading 11 codes for me. I'm like, I'm not ready for that. I can't do that. So with the trepidation, I kept writing. On the 22nd of December, I wrapped up the book. And I was, 
a ball of nervous wreck. So the next day I woke up and I knew I was going to start writing the code. Okay. Mm -hmm. The third code was called metadata. Okay. I was like, I knew I was about to, uh, you know, start, you know, writing or downloading the metadata. And I was just, I, I couldn't, I was so scared. So finally I said, you know what, as an engineer, I know what a metadata is. Mm -hmm. That's all I said. I knew I had to pull down a notebook. I put my hand in the notebook. And symbols that I've never seen in my life started flowing. For the next six days, I kept writing the symbols. There's about 1,000 symbols I downloaded. About 200 symbols every day for an hour, hour and a half. That fast lightning speed, I did it. So December 29th, as I'm writing the symbols, I realized I had to go and get a drawing notebook and uh, a black marker and start drawing. I went, I got, got it, I came home at 1 o'clock. In one hour, I'd drawn five distinct patterns at a lightning speed. A week later, I knew I had to go and get black paper and metallic pen. I came home, I started drawing things that I've never, uh, let me tell you, I'm not an artist. I've never drawn in my life as an artist. I don't know how to hold a brush. I don't know how to choose colors. My diagrams, I have sent it for a scientific review and it has come back. What happened is when I was drawing those diagrams, the diagrams were I didn't, I didn't have to think. It was just my being that just was, it was just pouring, pouring. And as I was sitting, I would hear, there, there would be clear audience, and I wouldn't know every single diagram I drew. I didn't know one diagram what it was going to be. All I knew was I had to sit. Sometimes I would think it's a straight line. I would put the ruler on the, on the paper, and something will happen to my hand that it will go askew. And I would be like, okay, that's what it is. And this is where I want to talk about imperfection. Mm. Every single one of my artwork has so many imperfections. Not that I tried to, but it happened. And those imperfections, which we call mistake in life, there's a different, I, I want to talk about mistakes later. This is not a traditional mistake that we're talking about. This mistake would create a miracle in that image. And I knew that these images were coming from beyond. Something more was channeling. So I took this work and I had it controlled remotely by one of the most uh, famous or the most, um, I wouldn't say famous, but I don't, very, uh, she's the best in either the U.S. or the world. Uh, her name is Dominic Sorrell, and she reviewed it, and she, it, it came back that these are galactic beings. I had an idea, because, you know, they kept telling me, we are, we are from the intergalactic circle. We are from the intergalactic circle. But because, like, you know, for me, you know, if you take Paul, Paul, can hear audience, and he, you know, says it. Mine is so telepathic, I can't tell the difference. It's so, my thought and my clear audience, they're not, they're not at vastly different planes. They're coming out of the same plane. So it's very mm -hmm. hard for me to distinguish. And all my artwork is galactic. But here's the funny thing about it. When I started the book, they talked about something called metatones. So they explained what a metatone is. A metatone is something that is naturally ringing in the universe. It's naturally available in, on the earth. They call, they call it uh, the tone of the forest. It, it's a forestical tone. And because we are so blocked, all our chakras are blocked, we're not able to listen to that rhythm. If all our chakras were open, 
and we, are, we understand or we feel in every single molecule of our body our expansiveness. We are that metatone, weaving exactly identical to the vibration of the earth or the universe or the floristical tone, whatever you want to call. When you are vibrating at the tone, you're naturally in a healed state. So now, because where we are, we're not able to hear that metatone. What they have done is they've converted that metatone in the form of an image. So when you look at that image, the frequency is what you're seeing. And this is what's so fascinating about it. And I took this, and then I have started becoming an avid researcher because my work, when it gets to people, I want it to be in the form that it needs to be, not some hocus-pocus. Because also, I am one of those people, if you tell me something, I, I'm not always following the scientific mode. I'm always, like, following my gut. But what I have realized in the U.S. is you have to provide a lot of scientific evidence for what you're doing. And there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with it. It's a very different culture. I'm not used to the culture. So what I'm doing right now is literally pouring myself into what sound healing is because my artwork is about sound healing. And they are coming from the galactic being. Um, so anyway, I didn't know if I answered your question, but I hope I did. You did. I mean, you went in, in several tangents, which had several <laughs> questions. Uh, because when you... <laughs> Sorry. No, I think that's fine because... I always believe that there's no accidents, right? And so mm-hmm. if everything happens for this reason, your IT background is, is perfect because, mm-hmm. you know, if you take the hocus pocus out of it, we now know that since the 1930s, 1940s, the science or the intelligence community, the you know, the governmental intelligence community has been using vibration and sound mm-hmm. to influence mm-hmm. people. And so when you look at mass media through movies or television, mm-hmm. there's the different frequencies that are hitting your subconscious, and it's not, you know, they're, they're not sitting in the lotus position saying, hey, we're sound healing. It's, it's yeah. hitting you in your daily life. Correct. Hamza, you hit it so right. You hit the point so on dot because this is very crucial for what, where we are right now. The one thing that I, I wanted to ask you is I've, I haven't been to Chicago as much as I've been to like what I call enclaves. And, and the enclave that we have in the U.S. is mm-hmm. like a California. We have pockets here in Georgia where I am, um, some mm-hmm. in the Midwest where you have these spiritual communities. What is the spiritual community like in Chicago? You know, I am blessed. I'll tell you that much. Um, I do have a lot of people that I, you know what, let me take it back. I have a small circle of friends that are very spiritual, but you know what? I'm going to divide as much as I hate to do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divide it because for ease of understanding. There is a new age movement, and then there's spirituality, and then people who are religious, and then the rest, Right? Mm-hmm. What I find is, this has been my struggle with the spiritual community. In the spiritual community, when you have, that is my experience, that doesn't mean it's everybody's experience. My experience has been like, if I'm going through a very challenging time, I have found that people are uncomfortable with it. Okay? So as a human being, when you're sitting somewhere and you have an issue, you have to process that entire feeling. But what happens is, we want to fix it by sitting, going, doing something, listening to a meditation or this or that or, you know. So for me, it, it was really uncomfortable because I needed to experience it. That's a new age movement I'm talking about, okay? Mm-hmm. It, either, it could be spiritual. It could be several things. But I've heard that the new age movement is pretty much infiltrated, okay? Then you have mm-hmm. spirituality. Spirituality, to me, is observing yourself, observing yourself, observing yourself, observing yourself, allowing yourself, allowing yourself, allowing yourself. That is the only way to understand who you are in totality. 
Therefore, I don't listen to any channelings anymore because if I am, let's say I'm doing something and mm-hmm. something happens, immediately I need to go and find something to equate my experience. See, so that is negating your experience in your totality. So for me, even within the spiritual community, I'm even a niche because I'm not saying I'm special. Please don't get that wrong. I have created a niche because I need, to, uh, I need people to understand the truth. If you are claiming yourself to be spiritual, but you're, you're you know, pushing yourself away from truth, then you can't attain the spirituality. So what does that mean, right? I'm, I'm going to sound really harsh, but that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm t- trying to talk about my experience. My experience has been, if someone says I need to be positive, that's good. But my experience has been, by, when I understand the truth, I'm organically brought to that place where there's a sense of peace. It is not about whether the truth is digestible or not. That's not that, is un- that is something that you have to process yourself in totality. So within Chicago, what I'm finding out is, all of a sudden, I'm finding a niche where all the people that are coming together with this, you know, thought process of really being aligned to truth, which is what I'm seeking, because I do need a community. And and Chicago is a great place for that, and it's amazing. And I'm constantly running into people who are able to see the truth. So for that, I'm eternally blessed. Mm Mm-hmm. And the reason why I was asking about the community, it made me think of of uh, Rupert. What's Rupert's name? Jane Roberts. Are you familiar with Jane Roberts? Oh, yes. I haven't okay. read her material. Oh, you know what? I have read one of her books. Yes. I love her. And the reason why I bring that up is, you know, sometimes a, 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 very, a community can help you see things. And so it wasn't until, like, she was channeling Seth, but then – she came to find out either through her father or through, I mean, through her husband or through the community that she was known as Rupert to the person she was channeling, meaning that she had previous relationships with that person. And so when mm-hmm. something would happen, when you said the thing that resonated, resonated with, well, there were a couple of things you said that resonated, but most recently was observe yourself, observe yourself, observe yourself. So that's like looking at yourself, I like to use the movie example. So if I'm watching the movie, that's myself. Or if the movie is the movie screen, if I'm watching the movie, that's observing myself in one way. But if I'm sitting in the back of the theater, I'm watching myself watch the movie. Mm-hmm. And so from from doing that, uh, they were able to establish, or Jane and her husband were able to establish the ongoing relationship that they had throughout time, not even linear time. And I was just wondering if you were able to, when you say a galactic being, say, I mean, right now I'm having a conversation with Uma, but when you're by yourself or you're on the the frequency on the metatone, do they know you with someone else where it's more of a conversational familiarity? You know what? It's funny that you ask that, right? Um, uh, I I wish I had a definitive answer for the answer is no. You know, I, I don't. Uh, part of the reason I think one of the things is um, I, you know, I'm going to go back to Paul Selig. In Paul's book, the guides say continuously, um, don't be attached to names or groups or entities. You know, be open about it. Don't have, try to have a name for it. And I, that has really been ingrained within me. Mm-hmm. And so I don't, uh, even my guides, I don't have a name for them. Um, mm-hmm. People could say, are they Pleiadians or are they Arcturians? I'm like, I don't know. Do I want to know? I don't know. <laughs> if they come and tell me, <laughs> okay, you know. <laughs> Fine, you know. So I really, you know, even for me, the name Uma is because I, I, I exist in this plane. Therefore, someone needs to call me. There are 7.7 billion people on the planet. So, you know. There is something that needs to be there energetically, mm-hmm. right? Uh, for mm-hmm. me, uh, I don't. But what is happening right now for me is a, uh, um, I don't know if I can equate that to Jane's, um, Jane and her husband's experience, but it's a little different. When the, they started channeling the sixth book for me, it is, the sixth book is mind-blowing, and I hope I can 
released it this year. Um, what happened is they, uh, they were asking me to really observe my body. Okay? The body is the vehicle to transformation. Everything goes through the body because we are, we are incarnated in this body. So what happened is, as they were dictating the book, they gave me several things. One is to observe your breath, uh, be in nature more, be on your feet more in the nature, and, you know, all these kind of things. So I started observing my body. So now, even the slightest vibration in my body, I feel it. Because what happens is my artwork is all about sound. It's completely about sound. So as I've been drawing, I'm very present to the cellular vibrations in my body. So basically, the way to achieving nirvana, okay, or whatever we call it, right, a oneness or emptying or whatever, nirvana is a state of really releasing all karma from your body. And how do you release karma? Through observation. So it doesn't mean observing like, you know, a movie. It is you take that and you take that even further. You know, if you're watching the movie and the movie causes an emotion, you're present to that emotion. So my work is very much about the emotion the vibration of the body. And recently I showed one of my paintings to a stranger that I uh, just got acquainted with. And this person has not been into, uh, you know, into spirituality, nothing. One look at my picture and she goes, something between my eyebrows is vibrating. What is that? <laughs> that is how powerful it is. It is all about people who have not done the work, people who have done the work, Everybody can equally relate to it. So it is all about sound vibration because if you look at it, every single cell in your body is vibrating at a frequency. Mm-hmm. So what happened to me is as through, throughout the vibration, uh, between November, December, January, and uh, most part of February, my body was hot, N- not like sweaty, like literally mm. like it's minus 21 degrees outside, and I want to be, like, not wearing a jacket. And what I noticed was now, I, when I started Paul's work, my seventh chakra and sixth chakra were vibrating for years. If I speak about it, they'll start vibrating. Now it's my ground chakra. My first and second chakra are vibrating constantly, and I'm very aware of it. See, that is the granularity that they're asking me to go. Become really, really granular. When you go really, really granular, you know what happens? You become an atom or a molecule. You're no longer the person Uma or Hamsa. Do you, you said you had stopped at February. Have you felt that the change in the metatone or the metadata has changed significantly globally since the global pandemic? You know, for me, it's an evolution. See, that here's the mm-hmm. thing, right? For me, imperfections don't really affect me, my art, as much. Imperfections give rise to more miracles. Um, I am one of those people who doesn't get scared when they say a disease is spreading. It's just, this is not new to me. When they started talking about SARS, I wasn't scared. I knew something else was behind it. It was just a gut intuitive feeling for me. And in general, I don't get scared. The minute they said it, nothing in my body went, oh my God. My body said, okay. And my work regardless of the pandemic, it has had its own evolution. The evolution has not been in terms of, oh, now you know how to draw better. That's not what it is. The evolution has been in the form of colors and patterns and things moving and in flux. And what has happened is when I started, they wanted to teach me 
patterns. One of the key elements of all my diagrams is the toroidal field. All my diagrams. About 95 to 98 percent of my diagrams are toroidal fields. When I started the toroidal fields, I didn't understand it was toroidal field. Now that I'm doing a lot of research, I thought it was a Fibonacci theory. But now that I look into it, it's a, it's a toroidal field. Because the way, when, when the images were given to me, within two weeks I did a workshop, within two weeks, people went crazy for my work. And since then I haven't done anything. Then I had to go to India and I, I sat with my family and I did the work. People had awakening of chakras, all kinds of things. So the evolution, you know, my, my work may evolve in terms of patterns, more granularity, more um, uh, detail, maybe because my own creativity is also flowing through. But regardless of the artwork I did first or now, they all have the vibratory quality to it. Mm. If that makes sense. I don't know if I answered no, the question. It, it does. It makes sense. And it, it made me think also about, I believe it was either yesterday or Friday, there was a big summit online on YouTube with Sadhguru mm -hmm. and Deepak Chopra. And so mm -hmm. uh, there seems to, especially in this year, there seems to be more collaborations of everyone um, combining their modalities, like what do they have to bring. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, with you dealing with two different continents and ultimately uh, globally and galactically, uh, mm -hmm. if there's been any outreach or have, has, that, has there been any channeling messages to you to, for mm -hmm. collaboration? Well, one of the things that, uh, so I always use my personal experience so that people can relate to it, okay? Mm -hmm. My personal experience has been, first of all, the first and foremost thing is to observe your body, okay? What is happening right now is there is a huge rise of energy that is giving opportunity to any kind of chakra opening. It is available more freely now than ever. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you had to seek a guru. You had to seek someone. Today, it is available so much more. The reason mm -hmm. it's available so much more is because when there's dark energy lifting, there's an equal amount of light energy lifting with the same intensity. So because it's rising with the same intensity, if you're open and you say, I'm ready, something will drop forth to your doorstep. There's no ifs or buts about it. Mm -hmm. So to trust yourself in totality is more important than anything ever. And to understand your sovereignness, your power, and to never give away to the, the power to an outside force. And mm -hmm. when I speak the outside force, I'm going to be very blatant about it. Do not give yourself to the media. Do not perpetrate yourself with a fear monger, because that mm -hmm. fear will multiply. What I find right now that is more soothing for me is understanding who we are. It is so much more fascinating. So the, my work, the is about sound healing. My work tells you anything and everything can be healed. Therefore, giving energy to someone saying this cannot be healed is an energetic vibration. So you choose which energy you want to give, give into. Mm -hmm. I have always believed, regardless of my spiritual evolution, I've always believed diseases are curable. Curable, I'm even going to take it further. All diseases can be healed. See, but what people think is, oh, if everything can be healed, nobody should die. That's not what we are talking about here. So death is playing, a, death and karma is causing a lot more stringency. We need to come out of that because we have been so, um, uh, let me take, a, take it back. 
There's so much fear that's been created about death. Death is fearful because of the limitation of karma. Our job is to release that karma, and as we release that karma, the fear of death disappears. That doesn't mean you don't have compassion for those that die. That it, that it's not to be misconstrued. So that is the most important message here. And for me, what is mind-boggling is, I was talking about earlier, when people in the spiritual community are afraid of this, that disheartens you. Because you're giving away your power for something that is causing and creating a fear from externally. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you, this is a third dimension question from a timeline perspective. And mm-hmm. there's one school of thought that we are currently in year eight, like the, mm-hmm. the reset of 2012 was a reset. You know, it wasn't just... I mean, third dimension, so because of the density, it takes a lot longer than fourth, fifth, or sixth uh, dimension, right? So we would be in the eighth year, and it's just a natural progression. The other school mm-hmm. of thought is 2020 is actually 2012, and the changes that are we're undergoing now are on another calendar, not the Gregorian calendar that we follow, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. actually would be 2012 today. So what's your take on that? Correct. So let's. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna offer some. Someone who's trying to call some. <laughs> I'm trying to. Um, so I have recently realized through my own growth to step out of dimension. Mm-hmm. Okay. And here is how it happened for me. When I was looking at it, I realized that you know I have to speak about it. It's sort of like the big elephant in the room because it's, it's a crucial piece of, of the conversation. I found out that the, the satanic cult sits in the fourth dimension. Okay? Mm-hmm. What that means, I really don't care. But what I realized is if they were sitting in the fourth dimension, then what is fifth dimension? That doesn't make mm-hmm. any sense. Immediately I took a step back and I said, whoa, that is also an illusion. Okay, when you become nirvana, when you release all the karma from your body, you are an all-encompassing entity. Mm-hmm. You have a choice in the matter to what is the purpose you want to step into next. You have a bigger purpose, which is you have this opening of this, all these galactic beings and you can choose and be where you are, where you want to be and where you want to go, rather than creating another life and coming back to the third dimension. Okay, Mm -hmm. and if that is the choice, that is okay too. Okay, Mm -hmm. so I'm going to take it further. Mm -hmm. The concept of time should be understood from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. If we think something is going to take X amount of time, it will take X amount of time. Mm -hmm. So I told earlier, this is a perfect time to create mass awakening. Mm -hmm. It is a perfect time to ascend at a quicker pace. This is such a crucial time. Okay? Now, if you choose, you can have an accelerated form of awakening. But you will will be the only one who knows that if you're ready for it. If that acceleration is too much for you, you shouldn't go there. Okay? Now, I have had a Kundalini awakening. My Kundalini awakening has, I'm still going through it. It is very subtle. The beginning of it was really difficult. No sleep. Hot, 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 hot. Now it is more mellow. Okay? For someone who has been through this journey for the last six years, that two-month period was hell. No sleep. Think about like sleeping for three to four hours, constantly being hot, the discomfort that caused. So you can ask for an ascension that is appropriate for you that crosses dimensions and timelines and breaks that structure as well. So if you're an infinite being, space and time construct are what you give energy to it. If you think 10 years, you get 10 years. Okay? Now, I want to go back to the Gregorian calendar because that's a very crucial piece of information People 
including myself, have been led to believe this is it. Because we have been put inside um, sort of like a prison, a karmic prison, we have not been able to understand the infinite nature of ourselves. Within that karmic nature, time space becomes very crucial, and that's okay. But also realize there's another whole other way of being that's available to us, which can break through these, you know, constructs. Understand that those who created time and space and karma are living in a timeless space. So when we give energy to that, we're going and agreeing to what they have created on our behalf. So these beings from the fourth dimension, they are living eternally. So why do we have to give into the timeline? If they can live eternally, we can actually break through that karma that has been imposed upon us and create a brand new reality. So the time-space construct is up to us. That means, I will tell you, we don't have time. Why don't we have time? If you look up at uh, at the three major things are going on, what are the three major things going on? COVID, Black Lives Matter, Ghislaine Maxwell. Three crucial things. In the Ghislaine Maxwell case, there are children involved. If I had a child and I knew that my child is being abused, I won't wait around. I won't be thinking about time. As a mother, time, space, construct will disappear because I will be working at a lightning speed to help my child. And that is what I want people to get because people are thinking it is personal. It is no longer just a personal journey. It is a galactic journey to free humanity from the shackles that have been put on us deliberately. Mm -hmm. And when you say shackles and you say prison, another way to interpret that, especially from a metatone or metadata standpoint, it would be a prism instead of a prison. So that's part of the, the vibration that you're stuck in that you're actually so eloquently talked about breaking through. And as a former IT person and a person that is a part of Amazon, as you mentioned, I wanted to know if you have seen the movie Mandela Effect. I have not yet. I I think you might like it. It came out last Mm -hmm. year. It's an independent Mm -hmm. movie, so, you know, it's not going to be blockbuster. But they're Mm -hmm. talking about basically what you just talked, what you just uh, discussed just uncovered how they were breaking through the prism, but they did it from, he, this guy's a gamer and he loses his daughter and he and his wife are going through grief and he's using his, his experience as an IT slash gamer to break through the prism. Yes. So, you know, I, I, I want to pause. I, I don't, um, you know, I may sound negative by using the word prison. Okay. Um, the reason I use the word Present is not to create fear or be negative. To understand the construct of our freedom as opposed to who we are supposed to be to who we are. The prison is, could be inside the prison, but it is the time space that we have been put inside of, if that makes sense to you. Gotcha. And I was thinking when we're talking about time space, <laughs> I totally lost time and space in speaking with you. We covered a lot of subjects uh, and briefly, so we're definitely going to have to have you back on. But the, I did want to cover the Lion's Wisdom since that is currently out. And, uh, you know, how could they – could give us a little synopsis of the Lion's Wisdom where people, people can pick that up and if they want to get in touch with you to learn more about sound healing. Okay, so um... – the Lion's Wisdom is available online. It is um, sort of like a precursor to all my work. And what is interesting about that is, of all my six books, that is very distinctive in its tone. And I was wondering why is it so distinctive, because I have a feeling that particular book was channeled by a, 
different set of entities compared to my rest of the five, five books, which is kind of interesting even for me because my work is so varied, you know, going from Lion's Wisdom to Earthwork to, this, to that. And you can find it on Amazon for sure, yes. Thank you for uh, pointing that out for me. Um, the, the line system is very much, if you are new to awakening, if you want to get a taste of the work, it's a good place to start. It, is, it has a lot of the new age quality to it. Um, it puts you in a space of uh, sort of, you know, dipping your toes in the water. Uh, did I answer mm-hmm. your question, Hansa? Yeah, no, absolutely. When you're you're dipping your toes in the water, especially now since we're not allowed to go to the beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, regarding my uh, galactic work, though, I am still working on uh, putting it on online. But mm-hmm. I'm getting ready to sort of um, put my work out soon. But there's two ways uh, to do my work. One is I sit with a person because each work is actually a multidimensional art on a single dimension plane. Okay? So I sit with people and explain to them and actually walk through them on how to use, uh, like, uh, do a session with them. That is one way. And I do it about like an hour to hour, 15 minutes. Um, and then if people are interested in buying the art, that is another venue as well. But the thing about the artwork I want to be uh, very diligent about is, is it's not just to buy and hang it at the home. That is not what it is for. People are captured by the beauty of the artwork, but this is much more because you have to really connect with the art in a way that your body is telling you something and giving you an information because some of the artwork, you may not even feel anything in your body. That means that's not the artwork. Um, So unless people are using it for the healing purposes, just to hang it at the home is not the purpose of it. If people just bought it and loved the look of it and I made a lot of money, that's not the purpose of it, just an FYI. And if people are interested in the art, I am actually preparing about uh, 15 artwork right now uh, for the purpose of sound healing and also printing at the moment. And they can email me um, uh, from my website. Uh, also my, uh, I don't know, uh, Hamza, you can also share, I don't know if you're going to put it down in the, you know, in the description. Uh, please put my email address as well and people can contact me through either one, through my website or my, uh, or my uh, email address. And are you saying your, your, your images, are they like, your favorite movie where uh, the best example I could use is when Harry met Sally. So when they were young, they had one perception. And then through time, they kept getting different perceptions. So the, I, I may have one perception looking at the image today, uh, but as I grow, then other, other things I'll pick up as, you know, as I develop. Hamza, I can't thank you enough for stating that. I can't believe <laughs> you got the crux of my work in just a single sentence. That is exactly what it is. It is a portal. It is a portal. So once you buy the image, you can't also just buy the image and say, oh, I'm going to work with it. That's not how it works, okay? You need a certain, you, you may have to sit with me, right? So the mm-hmm. work is a portal that keeps opening up chakras after chakras after chakras after chakras, after chakras and keeps clearing karma after karma after karma, okay? So the, the key to the images are you induce the metatone into your body and clear up the karma. And the only thing you have to be open to is the emotions that arise, the vibrations that arise from your body. That is the only thing you have to be open to. Mm-hmm. And the rest, it takes care of itself. You know, in other channeling work, people give you information. That is not my, how my work, uh, the, my, that artwork works. The way it works is you're going to give information, and based on that, I'm going to walk you through it. And twice when I had the workshop, people actually were able to see themselves within the art, where they were and where they were growing. It's also a life map. 
It is a galactic map for your life. I think that's huge, you know, as opposed to going to a big box retail shop and picking up an image off the wall that's mass produced. This sounds like this will help you through your individual journey. Correct. So once you go through, like, sessions with me and you understand it, then you don't need me. My thing is, I, I also won't just give away the images and say, go and work on it, because people won't know what to do with it. You know what I mean? When you mm-hmm. work with me and you're sufficient and you will know the amount of time you want to work with me, you can do one session with me, you may do two sessions, and then you'll say, okay, from now on I can pick it up and run with it. It's up to you. And if people, are keep, if people coming back to me, either I'm not doing the work or the art is not the right one for you or you're not doing the work. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I hate to be harsh about this, but it is, we're in very crucial times. We don't have time to dilly-dally with it. That's what I'm trying to say. No, I, I think it should be said because there's people that, you know, they get a reading every month at the local yeah. fair, and they're not really mm-hmm. growing from it. So no. they're giving all their energy to you or their, their reader. So Correct. I'm glad you made that distinction. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And, and with that, wow, we, I mean, we covered so much. It sounds like we only scratched the surface. So we definitely have to have you back on. Uh, you gave your site and all that. So uh, with that, you have been in tune to a, another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza and Uma. It was definitely a pleasure. Let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza. It was wonderful talking to you. Likewise. Hamza, you still there?